What exactly are the rich doing differently from the rest of us? I have spent most of my life only knowing the basics, missing out on the potential to make the most out of my time and my money. But after hours of digging deep on the internet, I found four sneaky money games that the rich play that generate hundreds of millions of dollars. 50 years ago, all of this information was gatekept, but now we live in the age of the internet, where even someone like me can steal these money strategies to build wealth and keep wealth. The first tactic that the rich use to build their fortune is leverage. And you can leverage more than just money, but let's start there. Rich people have a higher starting point. They come from wealth. They can use their parents' money to start their first business. What comes to mind first is Donald Trump. Donald Trump got over $400 million in today's dollars from his father's real estate empire to start his own real estate empire. But you don't have to have hundreds of million dollars to start out. Jeff Bezos, for example, started Amazon with $250,000 from his parents. Now that is a lot of money, but it's not unheard of. People buy houses all the time with $250,000 loans from a bank. And $250,000 isn't a magic number. Jeff Bezos could have started with half that amount of money. And if Amazon ended up being half of what it is today, it would be still worth $1 trillion. The main takeaway here is most people who are incredibly rich today started out with a loan, started out leveraging money that they didn't have themselves, money that they didn't have to take the time to earn. Whether that's money from your parents, which is the easy way to go, or if it's money from a bank or just a smaller amount of money, it doesn't have to be $250,000, but some amount of money that you can leverage to kickstart your business. Now, money, like I said earlier, is not the only thing that you can leverage. You can also leverage your network. The rich truly understand the power of networking. There's a reason why you hear all these stories about a rich family making a big donation to Harvard or Cambridge or some other Ivy League school so that their kids can get in it's not because they need those professors. I'm sure those professors are very good, but what they're paying for is the network. They want their kids to be surrounded by other kids from super rich families, other kids that are incredibly exceptional so that their kids can build a network. Fortunately for me, you do not have to be super rich to start working. Even if it's just in my town or my city, the more people that I know that I have a good experience with, the greater of a surface area that I have for opportunity because opportunity comes from people. I have a greater surface area for luck to happen in my life if I have a bigger network. Rich people build wealth by decoupling their time from their income. If I only have an hourly wage, then I can only increase my income linearly. I can spend more time to make more money. Whereas rich people build up assets, they leverage their money and they leverage their network and connections to compound their wealth. Traditionally, physical businesses and real estate have been the only way to leverage your money. But now we live in the age of the internet where there are so many more resources available. I don't have to have a $100 million advertising budget. I can leverage social media if I put in the time to grow my audience. I don't have to have a $400 million loan from my parents to start a business that sells a product. I can start a Kickstarter, I can take pre-orders, and only when I have that initial interest makes it much easier to get a small loan to fund that first round of product. In the age of the internet, we have so many resources at our fingertips to leverage both our time, our money, and our network. I have social media to expand my footprint. I have access to manufacturers around the globe. I can hire freelancers online and ChatGBT is booming. I have access to AI and software to improve my productivity. Clearly the rich are leveraging their resources by starting a business. And when you own a business, there are many doors that open to you that allow you to protect your wealth. I'm sure you've heard the memes of all these rich people that are not paying their fair share in taxes well, most of them are doing it legally because they know the rules of this money game better than anyone. The first and maybe best tactic that you can use when you own a business is depreciation. You can depreciate buildings, equipment, tools, any asset that drops in value over time, you can use that depreciation to offset your income and thus pay less taxes. And the beautiful thing about this is that you're buying an asset because it's making you more productive in some way. It's making you more profit, but you can still use the depreciation from that asset to pay less taxes on income that you're making 
maybe even from that asset. For instance, if you have a rental property, you can depreciate a rental property by over 3.6% every year over 27 years. So if I have a million dollar rental property in Hawaii, over $36,000 worth of income, I can deduct, not pay taxes on it because of the depreciation of that rental property. And that's not even including the interest that I pay on the loan or the property taxes. Maybe I'm in the cattle business and I wanna buy a tractor because it's gonna make me more money. If I have $500,000 in profit that year, I can use that $500,000, leverage it by buying a tractor, which will make me more money the next year, but I can still use that $500,000 that $500, over an eight year period to take away $500,000 of my income through depreciation and not have to pay taxes on that $500,000. I can't do it all in the one year, I have to spread it out over eight years, but I'm still able to leverage that tractor in multiple ways. The possibilities are endless, but one classic playbook is the monopoly strategy. You start by buying a smaller property and you continually trade it up to bigger and bigger properties. Like in Monopoly, you start with the houses and you end up with the hotel. With this strategy, you start with a loan, you leverage your money to buy that initial property, you get your rental income, and then you offset as much of it as possible using depreciation, property tax, interest, and then eventually, after you build a lot of equity in that property and it appreciates in value, you sell it. Normally, you would have to pay capital gains when you sell a property. However, using the 1031 exchange rule, you can sell one similar asset and buy another similar asset. In this case, selling a rental property and buying a bigger rental property. And you do not have to pay capital gains on that first sell. You can continue to kick the can down the road and you can do this indefinitely continually trading up to bigger and bigger properties, offsetting more and more of the rental income through depreciation until one day you eventually die, you pass that property on to your heir, and you still don't have to pay capital gains. You can create generational wealth without having to pay any capital gains taxes on any of those properties that you built up over your life. And you do not have to be rich to start this. You just have to start with a rental property or two that you can afford, that you can manage and go from there. That being said, real estate and owning a business are not the only ways that the super rich grow their wealth. It is very common for a significant portion of their cash to come from capital gains in the stock market. When you own an asset for over a year, any capital gains that you get and dividends would fall into the long-term capital gains tax bracket which is a much better tax bracket than the regular income tax bracket. For instance, if you have $94,000 in long-term capital gains, married, filing jointly, you are paying 0% in taxes, whereas the corresponding income tax bracket would be 12%. If you're making $583,000 in a single year of long-term capital gains, you are in the 15% tax bracket, whereas the corresponding income tax bracket would be 35% in taxes. Fortunately for us, we do not need to be super rich to start taking advantage of the long-term capital gains tax bracket right now. For instance, one popular security to own is an S&P 500 ETF or index fund. If I invested just $100 per week in the S&P 500, then that would grow to over $1 million by the time I turn 65, which I could use to fund my retirement and pay very little in taxes. But long-term capital gains are not the only way that the rich shield their investments from taxes. Real quick guys, thanks for watching. And if you've made it this far, please do me this one simple favor and hit the like button. In return, I'll do my best to create better and better content like this. Back to the video. There is a very interesting strategy called the Mega Backdoor Roth IRA. A Roth IRA is an account where you can invest in securities and you are shielded from paying taxes on any of the gains or dividends that you get from those investments. This compares to the traditional IRA where you put pre-tax dollars in, you get to benefit from tax savings up front, but then whenever you pull that money out down the road after it's grown quite a bit after many years, you have to pay taxes in the regular income tax bracket. So for the super rich, having a lot of money in a Roth IRA is incredibly powerful because they don't have to pay any taxes when they take it out. Normally, when you put money into a Roth IRA, you're only allowed to put $7,000 and you're only allowed to contribute if you make less than a certain amount of money. 
If you're single and you're making more than $146,000, you are not allowed to put money directly into a Roth IRA. But this is where the mega backdoor Roth IRA strategy comes into play. If you own your own business, you can set up your 401k to allow for in-plan conversions. In this way, you can put $23,000 into your Roth 401k, and then you can put $46,000 into a post-tax traditional 401k, which can then be rolled over into a Roth IRA. So not only are they able to put money into a Roth IRA, despite making more than what the, con the contribution limit is or the income limit is, but they're also able to put almost seven times the amount of money, $46,000. And then if you're over the age of 50, then you can put an extra $7,500 because you get extra space in your 401k for what's called a catch-up contribution. Between the Roth 401k and the mega backdoor Roth IRA, if you're over the age of 50, you can put $76,500 into a Roth account every year. If you do this for 10 years and have average stock market returns invested in the S&P 500, over 10 years of doing that strategy, you will have $2,682,000 in a Roth IRA tax-free. If you do this strategy for 20 years, then you'll have over $9.5 million in a Roth IRA, 100% tax-free. Now, there is a chance that your company does allow for a mega backdoor Roth strategy, but it is very rare. Most people who are able to do this own their own business and they're able to set up their 401k plan to make it happen. But if you're curious if you can do it, you just have to see if the technical term is, does your plan allow for after-tax contributions plus an in-plan Roth conversion? If that is the case, then consider yourself lucky. Otherwise, you just need to take advantage of your 401k matching, your Roth IRA, and your HSA to squeeze out as much tax advantage sheltered accounts as possible. Earlier in the video, I mentioned the power of real estate as an investment. Now, when you're thinking about your primary residence, it's true that you can get a loan to purchase the home and you can leverage the equity in your home through a home equity line of credit. However, there are many unique downsides to owning a home as your primary residence. One common pitfall that many people fall into, including my wife and I, is buying a home as our primary residence and thinking it will be a good investment. In many cases, it is much better to rent and then invest the difference in other assets. In this video, I share our experiences and our calculations on the costs of owning a home compared to renting. Check it out, I'll catch you on the flip side.